one needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy shine on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountains. Our God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Good morning and welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're with us wherever you are. We're just glad that you're here. We'll start off today by passing the peace here the way we do, which is waving at everybody. Hello. Peace to everyone. Sometimes share this. Even to Brandon in the back. <laughs> he was the only person I passed the peace to for a very long time. And we know that you're passing the peace in your homes. This is a reminder if you are at home to get together whatever you'll be using for communion this morning. And for those of us who are here, a reminder that we need everyone to fill out the yellow connect cards that are in the pews to let us know that you were with us. Um, and we collect those as you're heading out in the box at the back. Um, but it's also a place to put any of your prayer concerns uh, or anything you want the church to know about, maybe some joys that are happening, and update any information. Make sure we have the most recent emails and phone calls, because whenever we want to be able to reach out to you pastorally, it's never good when I call and says, this number has been disconnected. <laughs> this number doesn't work. So making sure that we have that. Um, and a reminder that everybody has individual communion in the pew with them and that uh, when you're finished as you head out we will have a trash can for you to dispose of it and we have uh, wonderful people who will help replace it so that it's ready for next week as well. Um, we do have a special uh, visitor speaking to us during offering and that's uh, Will Stoffer. He's here. Will you wave? There we go. Hello. Uh, who I've met through Who's Your Action, uh, a group that I've been participating in and uh, invited him to come and uh, tell us a little bit about that. But with all of that... Let's take a deep breath from the God who created us and prepare for worship with our call to worship. Remember, we have come together because of God. We are created and sustained by the power of God's love. We have come together because of Jesus. And we accept his revolutionary example that shows us what life really means. We come together because of the Spirit. We experience that presence that inspires us and blesses our fellowship wherever it may be. Let us worship God through Jesus in the Holy Spirit. Let us pray.
In this time of prayer, may we always remember, God, that you are with us now. That there is no place in which God is not. Wherever we go, there God is. Now and always, God is encompassing us, is looking upon us with mercy, and is ready to hear us when we call. As we pray the words Jesus taught his own disciples, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. prayer. God, we come today and I speak a prayer to you today of not only what I may need, but also what others may need, what I may be feeling, but also what others may be feeling. 
God, I'm tired. We are all tired. We're tired of being anxious. We are tired of the unknown. We're tired of being scared and worried. God, I am tired and we are tired. Tired of the hate between brothers and sisters. Tired of the speech that divides us. Tired of the lack of understanding that seems to fracture us. God, I am tired and we are tired. We are tired of the violence, tired of the lies, tired of the selfishness we practice instead of compassion. So God, I pray to you and we pray to you to bring reconciliation to our hearts, to our churches, into our communities. Move us and push us into action. God, I pray to you and we pray to you that we hear your call, that we will respond to your call, and that when we respond, we do so in love and in service to your creation. God, bring your spirit into this place. Give us what we need as a church to follow you faithfully in this time and forever. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. So we're on our third week of our four-week series, Redefining Church, which each week we focus on a practice or a ritual that makes us church, that's kind of really fundamental to who we are, but has been radically changed because of the circumstances we find ourselves in. The first week we looked at worship through the story of the feeding of the 5,000, remembering that receiving and offering compassion and being inspired to discipleship are fundamental to worship, and that Worship is one of the places Jesus can feed and fill us, and many more beyond just us. Last week, we focused on studying, and we learned from the Canaanite woman, who in the story was also known as the enemy, who reminded us that studying is essential, including studying ourselves, studying our own beliefs and practices and ways of being to remember just how big and vast God's grace and God's healing is. And each week we've talked about how this redefining is like being on an expedition, going into unknown lands, trying to pack what we think we'll need and discovering that we need entirely new things for this new expedition. And so this week is about serving. Now, serving is a core practice to all Christians, but it is definitely part of the DNA here at First Christian Church of Jeffersonville. And if you ask the people of our community, I mean, even Rory agrees. Uh, he, yes, we are good at this. He said they would say that we're a place that likes to help their community, that we step up in a crisis, that they know that we care and that we have a long history of this. I got to talk uh, to Bruce Barkhauer this week, who's a former pastor and certainly one of my former mentors, about what kind of things were in place outreach-wise and service-wise when he was here a couple decades ago about what Christmas baskets were like even back then and um, how he could always see the potential of how much more we could do in the community and trying to always expand that and find new ways to serve. And uh, our scripture today talks about the specifically kind of service that people who follow Jesus are called to do or what kind of shape that's going to take. And we're still in Matthew. We've been in Matthew for a while. Uh, We're in chapter 16 this time, but it starts in verse 21. He says, From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who will lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? 
or what will they give in return for their life? So first off, I just want to admire some wordplay that Matthew does, because the exact verses right before this passage is where Peter has made his confession, and Jesus says, Peter, you will be the rock upon which I build my church. Because he sees Peter's faith in him, Peter's willingness to learn and serve and sacrifice, what he sees in Peter is all this potential. And that word potential rang with me. I remember, now it's been 10 years ago, when I joined the Wabash Leader Program, the, the Raymond Williams, who's a longtime religion professor, was the founder of it, and he was really clear with us. He's like, we see potential in you. He said, if you tell people they're already leaders, they won't listen or keep learning. He said, we think we see something in you. We think we see something Indiana could use. And I thought about Jesus sees this in Peter. I, you know, pastors see this in their congregations. I, of course, see this here, that we have all the potential here. We have the abundance and capabilities to serve and to do. Because when we finally get on fire about a ministry, we just go. We blaze the path for it, whether that's been camp in the last few years or any of our feeding programs or blessings in the backpack, you name the list. But the wordplay happens in our passage today that that's not all that Jesus sees in Peter and his encounter with him today. Jesus who, or Peter who is the rock, has now become the stumbling block. See what he did there? That's clever. I appreciate that. <laughs> As faithful and honorable and willing as Peter is, he also has a real particular idea of what following Jesus should be like, and it does not involve crosses and death. But Jesus knows that it does, and that there is no way around it. He is going to have a cross-shaped ministry. But Peter like Judas later, believed that Jesus would use the same tools as the empire, use control and dominance and power to overcome, that he would be the military messiah that they had been waiting for. But as Jesus keeps trying to teach them, if you just keep doing this more of the same, you will get more of the same. If you want a different culture, a different system, a different life, then you have to use different tools and do it in a different way. Tools that might make you uncomfortable, that might weigh very heavily on you. And that's because Jesus is a revolutionary with a revolutionary plan, not just to change things like a little bit, not to slightly help people, but to dramatically change how we love God, how we know how much we are loved by God, and how we love each other and all of our neighbors. And apparently it's going to involve crosses. Now for Jesus, this is obviously a literal cross, a tool of torture, death, and the ways to teach the public a lesson. Don't mess with the empire. Don't mess with the system. It's dangerous. So automatically, Peter and pretty much the rest of us agree that picking up crosses seems like a terrible idea. But Jesus uses this very small word, and I think in the Greek, I think it's da. I could be pronouncing that wrong. It's been many years since I've been in Greek. But it means must. It's not maybe. It's not might be. Might be, could be an option. He says he must suffer and die on this cross. In Matthew's version, Jesus is crystal clear how this is going to go. But Peter can't see it because there's nothing in his history, nothing he's been taught, nothing in his study of scripture, which we don't know how much there was of that, had prepared him for this idea, this way of doing it, because he understood like there might be conquering and there might be, you know, some victory and maybe you watch your enemies suffer. That sounds right. That sounds like what I've been raised on, but not the Messiah. The Messiah is not supposed to go through this way. He had a very particular image of what the Messiah would be and what following the Messiah would be like, but it wasn't the one Jesus was presenting to him. And I realized when I started to think about the image of 
Peter, you are the rock upon which I built the church, that I do this in my own head. I have an image. I imagine a really big rock. And I imagine Peter getting up on top of it and proclaiming the good news and the gospel, which is kind of the image we have of him in Acts when he preaches on Pentecost, right? So I think that's probably where I put those two together. Then, of course, I had to go back and read it really closely. And you know, when you read it really closely, you find stuff. And he says, you're the rock on which I will build my church upon. You will carry it on your shoulders. I believe you have the potential to carry that weight. And so following Jesus in the ways that he's calling him to do might look a lot less like this and a lot more like this. bent over, looking down, maybe even being looked down upon. So it might look a lot more like picking up a cross. And he goes on to say that. If you want to follow me, pick up your cross. And he says, this is the image of cross-shaped serving that Jesus gives to us and to his disciples. Now, lots and lots of people serve. They do good work, and not all of this, they don't have to be Christians, they don't even have to be religious. We know that people, uh, one of the quotes was, I think, on, is it kiva.org, some donation, yeah, there's an atheist group that always ranks up in the top, you know, two or three up there. So we know that serving can happen across groups, but what makes something cross-shaped serving? What brings the cross into it? And part of it is about redefining our idea of what success looks like. It's just like how Jesus had to flip it for Peter. We have to flip it for ourselves that it's not always about bigger or about more or about the list, bulleted list on the sheet that we can talk about at the end of the year, though I will be doing that during stewardship next month. I think cross-shaped service is also most often about unexpected results. Um, and being reminded that sometimes it's about the people we serve, but sometimes it's about us as people serving. That it's about doing the hard thing if we know it's the right thing. Even if it's the unexpected, that we've never done that thing. So I started thinking about ways that we serve and ways that they are cross-shaped. And last week we learned that we had won a stewardship award from the region and the general church, um, which is always lovely. Again, at our DNA and our core is that we are a generous uh, giving church. But there are lots of generous churches. There are lots of generous churches in Indiana, but not all of them. This We were awarded for donating both to the special day offerings, but also to the Disciples Ministers Ministry Fund. I have to remember the new name. They change the name all the time. But the intention is those funds go to congregations around Indiana, those go to congregations and people around this country, sometimes they go around the world. For me, the cross-shaped serving part is, in our giving, we understand that our resources are not just meant for us here. They're not just meant for me. We understand that we're supposed to give to these services that may never benefit us that may help people we will never see because we are in serving God's kingdom, which is much bigger than just us, and that that's still valuable. And we've made that choice. I think about a lot of our feeding ministries here. As I said, we have the backpack ministry. That's the one I think about most often, but we also have our food pantry. We also have our Christmas baskets. And I think feeding the hungry, it's in Matthew 25, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me, that's important. But the element for me that makes it cross-shaped is that people in this church who are not the same, who are across a wide spectrum for any number of reasons, whether it's basketball teams or politics, we're in a wide spectrum, but we all agree, we've all come together around the moral issue that we think children shouldn't go hungry. There's not a member of this church who doesn't agree with that that people should have enough food to eat, that will never be so different that we can't all agree on that, and so we serve and we give and we share to live that out. 
The other place I've seen it is we've had a couple of programs that have had to directly change because of the, the virus. Um, one of them was obviously our Clothe a Child program. We normally go into a store and we go with people and shop with them and we just couldn't, can't be doing that. <laughs> can't be doing that. So we had, we, but we came up with an alternative. Because what we cared about was we still wanted to help people, we still wanted to serve people, even if it wasn't in the same way. We had to adapt. We had to change. And in the process, in some ways, we had to trust the people we were helping. We had to empower them in a way that we hadn't before. Because the larger issue was the helping more than the how. And the same thing happened in our closed closet. We haven't been able to have it open for a long time, and we're not taking donations, right? Is that correct? Okay, we're not taking donations. I want to be clear <laughs> before you get inundated. But before, we used to have individuals come and come down to the closed closet and get what they needed. And that's good, that was, that was useful. Chad, would, Chad or Milana would chat with them, we'd find out about other things. But right now, what started happening is we've had organizations that serve this, the city, identify a real specific need, and they come in and they get exactly what they need and they head out and we've spaced it out so it's safe and we make sure people aren't there all the time. But for me, the cross ship is the ability to adapt and to change, just like the clothe the child that we didn't just stick to the one way we did it, but we said, what we want to do is help. What we want to do is serve, even if it's different than the way we did it before. And we end up building relationships with places we hadn't, and who knows what God will reveal in that encounter. And then I started to think, like, well, but to us, we're like, I don't know. How much of, you know, some of that's a sacrifice, but is it really? And we think carrying a cross is a sacrifice. Carrying a cross is heavy and dangerous. And what I want to say is, like, having been here for such a long time, it's taken us years to get to this point, to where we are now with the serving that we do now. We had to learn, and we had to change, and we had to adapt, and we had to agree to do it. Whatever those new things or changes needed to be. Because Jesus is clear, you have to pick up your cross, and everybody's cross is different. What's difficult for me to pick up may be no big deal to you, or what may be very difficult for you may not be as hard for me. And we've challenged each other in this, but you can't make anyone pick up their cross. It has to be willingly. I can't make you care about something, and you can't make me either. You can try and make me do it. But what I do know from serving here for as long as I have, this is a place that knows the value of that sacrifice. And the way I know it is because you keep doing it. You keep picking it up, and you do it because you know what's on the other side. That the cross isn't the end of the story. Part of what happened with Peter is he didn't listen to the whole thing that Jesus said. That's one of the reasons he became a stumbling block, is he didn't really listen, because he said, the Son of Man will suffer, he will die on a cross, and, and, in three days, he will rise again. Because I think sometimes we're so focused on the painful part or the changing part or the sacrifices that we don't want to make or the difficulties, we forget that on the other side, waiting for us is resurrection, is brand new life. Peter got so consumed with the idea of Jesus' suffering, he entirely missed the good news. He gets there eventually. That in the midst of the carrying, we forget that this is also about bringing wholeness to the broken places. That's who we are as disciples. And that we're not just bringing that wholeness to those we serve, but that that wholeness also happens inside each of us. I've invited, as I said earlier, Will Stoffer to speak during our offering. Um, and as I said, he's from Hoosier Action, and it's an organization. He was very faithful and kept calling and kept calling till I called him back, and I did. 
So I've been participating in there in a chapter meeting, and he and I have been having uh, conversations, which are great. And one of the things I want to lift up that's been so good about our conversations is that Will is very good at helping me connect how my faith and my, under, my love of God and my understanding of the kingdom is connected to concrete ways I can serve the world now. Um, he's going to talk a little bit more about it, and you can get more information from him about uh, an initiative they're working on equipping people uh, to vote uh, in places that there were low turnouts. But if you really get him going, if you really want to see him excited about something, it's getting people empowered and excited around moral issues that we all agree on. Things like we don't believe our resources are just for us, but for many. That we believe children and people shouldn't be hungry. That we understand that we are about working together to serve the needs of others because we believe, listening to Jesus, that this can result in new life, in resurrection, in places that we thought things were dead, it's not true. In places we thought things could not live, God can show up there in unexpected ways. That when we advocate for wholeness for others, even if it means carrying a cross at first, that we also end up creating wholeness in ourselves. And in this new season we're in, we're discovering new places of brokenness are now on like system levels, not just individual levels, and they require a different kind of cross-bearing than we've ever done here before. Because we're a doing kind of church, and we are, but it might involve more listening and empowering, more advocating, more interrupting systems. And to constantly remember that God and Jesus, specifically Jesus, when he's talking, even to Peter, that he's not calling us simply to suffering, but to new, resurrected, abundant life. He says that the life or the ways that we might be losing is nothing. It's nothing compared to the life that we're gaining and creating and building. That when we carry the burdens and share out of our own abundance, we do it so that those who are suffering, including ourselves, will know relief. Well, I'm proud to tell you this church is a congregation of people who know how to pick up their crosses. And I can testify to it because I've seen it. They know how to do hard things because they've done it before. And in the process, they've discovered the depth of their faith as they will do again and again and again because they already know what kind of abundance and wholeness can come to them and to this congregation and to this community and this world from cross-shaped serving. We come to communion. Uh, kind of two things from that sermon that really stuck out to me. One is just Peter himself. I went, uh, luckily it was last year, we got to do a family trip, a once in a lifetime trip to Italy and Greece and got to see St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, what, a, what a place. So when you, I love that passage. And when you read about Peter being a stumbling block, hey, Peter didn't have it all figured out and like, you know, was reaffirmed by Jesus all the time. Boy, you're, just, you're killing it, buddy. You got, it, you got it going on. You're perfect in every which way. Like you, no, Peter goofed. You know, Peter would mess up and, and it was a stumbling block for people. But Peter changed. Peter learned and grew as a person. He, he began to understand. And I, I think in ways that we serve, um, we, ha- we have to be willing to change and maneuver uh, the same way, uh, because we, we, we learn about different things, and when I think about this image of the cross and the ways in which we serve, you know, I, I look at issues in the world that it seems like people are carrying a burdensome cross. Child, children being hungry is one of them, and when we can step in, like we did years ago, when we paid off the bills, the past due bills for our local elementary school, that was a way in which we helped carry that cross as a community for those people. What are issues today that people are carrying a heavy cross that we can lift it? Racial injustice would be one for me that, that moves me, right? 
But there may be multiple issues. Emily Caskey, uh, we talked about feeding, uh, is moved to uh, feed people, which is great. So she wanted to really, get, she got fired up and wanted to do the community garden. Let's go. Is there an issue that's moving you? Let's go. You know, and to do new things as a church, we have to try new ways. Um, and, to, and to alleviate that burden of the cross that people feel. Let us be like the person that comes out of the crowd and helps Jesus to carry his own cross. Let us pray. Holy are you, O God, for your mercy is endless. You have filled all creation with light and life, and your glory stretches through the heavens. It was you who led Abraham and Sarah to the land of promise who saved your people from the desert of bitter tears, who called them to the land of the living. It was you who blessed Miriam and David when they sang and danced in holy places. And through Jesus the Christ, you taught us to celebrate. Those who were blind saw the son of your goodness. The crippled leapt for joy, and those who were locked in the prison of their fears were given the freedom to love. Your spirit calls us now in this place and in all of the places where we are gathered to gather all people into our celebration, to help the lame, to wipe away tears with an outstretched hand, the bread of our being loved, the wine of our joy, stand as reminders that miracles in faith and risk continue to happen. In thanksgiving and remembrance, we ask you to bless this bread and cup so that in sharing them together, we shall be your church. Amen. On that night that Jesus sat with his disciples, he took bread and broke it and said, this is my body broken for you and he took the cup and he poured out the wine and he said this is my blood shed for you for the remission of sins for as long as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup you do this in remembrance of me I'm going to welcome Will up, but uh, in this time of offering, we talk about lots of kinds of giving. Uh, in this place, we talk about the giving of our tithes, but also the giving of our time and our talents in ways that we uh, may or may not have expected to. And so as Chad said, like, what is the thing that you're excited about, whether you're joining us online or you're here in person, and Will wants to offer us a little more about that. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Mead, for having us today, and thank you for letting us worship with you today. Um, my name is Will Stauffer. I'm an organizer with Hoosier Action. Um, Hoosier Action is a nonpartisan independent community org that works on making life better for all Hoosiers. Uh, we believe that um, everyday people should have a decision over the decisions that are being made about their lives and that our democracy is actually better when more people have a seat at the table. Um, I do this work because I believe that every human being has, um, is created in the image of God and has a divine light within them. I believe that we all deserve to live full lives of dignity and to respect and to have the opportunity to become the people we're supposed to be. Um, but too often in our state, the social and economic conditions that we live under don't allow people to become the people they're supposed to be or get that opportunity. It's just work, 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 survive, 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 and then you die. And I know this because I've seen it happen to my family, to my mom, to my dad, and now to my sisters. Um, and with um, that was like all before the pandemic hit, right? And with this pandemic, we've seen like a real heightened um, sense of pain and suffering and the, the real um, issues people are dealing with. So um, a lot of joblessness right now and unemployment insurance is right now. So people are suffering from that. Our eviction moratorium is going to be up, um, leaving a lot of people at risk of being homeless because they don't have enough money to pay their rent. COVID cases are still on the rise. Kids and families are wondering what to do about going back to school. My wife, Katie, she's here. She's a school teacher. She's worried about um, dealing with her kids and the safety and things like that. Um, mental health is a big issue as well. Um, so much anxiety. So there's like all this like pain and real things going on in people's lives. And then at the same time, right, that all this is happening, we need so much. Um, 
we live in the richest country in the world and have tons of resources, but we're not actually taking care of our people. The rich and powerful and big corporations are actively making tons and tons of money right now. And, it, and it's not only like this hoarding of this money and like profiting off of our pain, it's using that money then to influence our laws that only make them richer. And um, then they, they, they also divide us along race and class and geography and culture, either blaming, and we, we kind of feed into that being like, oh, it's either, you know, your Democrat, Republican, red team, blue team, um, or, um, yeah, they, they divide us using these messages, or we end up like blaming ourselves um, for some of the problems we see when we actually have enough to take care of everybody. So the good news is well, there's a solution to this, and that's like coming together, refusing to be divided, and actually working on laws that actually help everyday Hoosiers. Um, whether we are, we're white, black, or brown, we all want to live in safe communities. We all, all want to have enough for our, um, our friends and family and to like become the people we're supposed to be. And so I really do believe that the kingdom of God is like here and now, and it's still not like perfect, and that Jesus really cared about the needs of other people. And so I want to invite you um, to join me in trying to figure out how to, we can make life better for all Hoosiers and actually like um, influence some of these laws to make them better. Um, so coming up on this like whole, um, whole like election season, we have trainings in August where we're laying out our election program. And basically what we're doing is we're registering voters, um, we're holding town halls on our issues and values, we're making some voter guides, and we're trying to get as many people involved so that when the legislative session for the state comes up, this spring, we can bring a bunch of people at the same way that like Jesus went to the halls of power in Jerusalem. So we need to go to Indy and advocate for good laws and things that we want to see happen. Um, so our next training is August 22nd, next Saturday at 10 a.m. It's a Zoom call. Um, I have some information here. Um, also, you can contact Pastor Mead about that. And then, yeah, I also, um, the best part of my job is I get to meet people and do like one-to-ones with them and like ask them what they want to see change, learn, learn about their story. So I'm really curious about you all. Like, what do you want to see happen in Jeffersonville? What do you want to see happen in our state? So um, I would love to do a one-to-one with you or a phone call or a Zoom call sometime. So um, let me know about that or contact Pastor Mead. That'd be great. So anyway, thank you. Jesus.
So before I offer our blessing, we have a couple of announcements. Again, youth group meets tonight uh, as regular, and Worship and Wonder continues to meet live on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. I know the Hilliards were there this morning, uh, and our men's group and our disciples class and our Ruth group are all still meeting. Um, so if you want information about those, please contact the office. And the connector continues to go out, which please keep up with that uh, so you know new things uh, that are coming along the pike. Keep looking for that. Continue to send in your prayer requests and joys. We love hearing both of those. Uh, we have, I always say we have good prayers usually here, but we have to know what to pray for. And a reminder uh, to share this worship service, share our devotions, uh, share the things that we're offering, because you never know who might be needing to hear the good news this week. Um, and I also want to ask for prayer for continues. Our, your wonderful elders have been uh, participating in a book club for several, a book group for several weeks now on white fragility. And they're, they're doing, talk about doing hard work, talk about picking up a cross that's, that's difficult and uncomfortable. And they are doing very faithful work in that. So um, I know you're already praying for the elders, but if you'll just add a little extra one in there, uh, they'd appreciate it. I've been really proud of them for that work. And then obviously uh, Will will be outside for a little while, maybe even literally outside for a little while. That might be the safest place. But when he says he wants to hear what you care about, he means it. He really wants to listen. He's been on very long calls with me and hearing about the things that I care about. And I know how much this church family cares about this community and about uh, the people in it and taking care of them. So I encourage you to do that. But as you leave this place, know that you are the accepted and acceptable. You are the loved and lovable children of God capable of doing very hard things on behalf of Jesus and knowing that on the other side is resurrection and good news. Amen.